Thank you, Mr. League. Uh, greetings to all our brethren around the world and all of our friends. It's been a very warm summer day here in Charlotte, but uh, we've seen the crepe myrtle trees blossoming around the city and adding beauty to our day. So we really appreciate the summer. As we heard the announcements, our ministers are preaching the gospel in cities around the world. Mr. Mario Hernandez gave a Tomorrow's World special presentation in Mexico City just two weeks ago. And then last weekend, we had Tomorrow's World special presentations in Belfast and Dublin. And then, two were given, as you heard the announcement, in Edmonton and Grand Prairie. And that was by Mr. Gerald Weston. And then Mr. Phil Senna gave one uh, last week in Austin, Texas. And Dr. Douglas Romeo uh, gave a campaign in Auckland, New Zealand on the Sabbath. Now, they are in Auckland 18 hours ahead of us. So it's, uh, let's see, it's 8.37 in the morning, Sunday morning, they're in Auckland. And Joshua Penman just told me he got a message from his mother that there were 360 in attendance for the TWSP in Auckland. So that's exciting. It's a new record. I'm scheduled to speak in Chicago uh, next Sabbath for a TWSP, so I don't know that we can break that record, but you can pray that next Sabbath we'll have a good uh, response in Chicago. And then I'll be speaking in uh, Milwaukee on Sunday. Uh, Dr. Uh, Douglas Winnale will continue on from uh, Auckland to Brisbane, and then Melbourne, Adelaide, and Perth. So again, the gospel is going out around the world. And we're growing daily in numbers and growing in love towards one another. Uh, Christ is the head of the church, and he's training us to be kings and priests and judges in tomorrow's world. You can, uh, again, review the sermon I gave a few weeks ago on our incredible human potential. And as a body, as a team, we must always grow in love towards one another. So I want to ask you today just how strong is your agape love, that is, God's spiritual love. Let's turn to 1 Peter, the first chapter, 1 Peter 1. And here we have an exhortation by the Apostle Peter. And I wonder how many of us are really fulfilling this instruction. 1 Peter 1, verse 22. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth, and it's interesting as you read through 1 Peter that he connects obedience with hope, connects obedience with faith, and connects obedience with love. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart having been begotten, as it should read, having been begotten again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So we're instructed to love one another fervently with a pure heart. We need to examine ourselves and just see how well we're doing that. Let's turn to John, the 15th chapter, John 15. And here again, we have Christ's instruction in concerning that love towards our neighbors and love towards one another. John, the 15th chapter, starting with verse 12. It's interesting that mainstream Christianity doesn't like the word command or obey uh, because they s falsely say that, well, if you obey God, if you follow commandments, that's salvation by works. Well, that's a false argument. It's heresy. God is not going to give us the gift of his salvation unless we obey him, as we just saw in 1 Peter. Here in John, the 15th chapter, and starting with verse 12, Jesus says, This is my commandment. Are you willing to accept commandments? This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. So again, Christ's whole life demonstrated how we love one another. Verse 15, um, no longer do I call you, sorry, verse 13, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. That means your time, your emotions, your energy. Greater love has no man than this. So how can we love one another? We've had several sermons on the topic. 
uh, Dr. Meredith's uh, sermon number five, four, five, six, Love Each Other as Christians. And a sermon I gave some time ago, sermon number 426, Love One Another. But today I want to focus on a particular way that we're to love one another. Let's turn to James, the fifth chapter, James 5, verse 16. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So we thank God for some miraculous healings in recent months. And brethren have been anointed by God's ministers, and many have been divinely healed. Uh, Mr. Meredith gave an inspiring uh, sermon here just two weeks ago titled, God is Our Healer. And in that sermon, he emphasized that we need to grow in faith, and he remarked how we need to practice God's laws of radiant health. And in the June 9th World Ahead Weekly Update, Dr. Meredith made this statement, quote, We all need to thank God for the wonderful increase in divine healings we have experienced this past year. There have been so many which have, we have described to you. Also, for the 9.2% increase in church attendance here in the United States, for a continuing excellent response to our Tomorrow's World telecast. So, brethren, I know that most of us give fervent prayers to, for others to be healed. And as we just read in James 5.16, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Po prayer is powerful. We heard that in the sermonette. And I'm sure that many of us are faithful in praying daily. But we need to pray more fervently for one another that there will be more healings. And let's pray for one another that we can complete our calling and our mission. The title of the sermon today is Pray for One Another. So are your prayers really effective? One key for effective prayer is to pray fervently. And I didn't know that Mr. Colon was going to be speaking on that subject. Uh, but here are the 12 keys for answered prayer. He mentioned key number seven, I believe it was. But key number nine in Dr. Meredith's booklet is pray fervently. I'll just quote from it on page 14. I once knew an extremely dedicated and zealous servant of God who often said, brethren, one of the reasons we in our modern society do not receive more answers to prayer is that we do not put our hearts into our prayers. One of the key scriptures he would then cite is Hosea 7:14 which describes one reason that God did not hear the prayers of the ancient Israelites. The Moffat translation perhaps renders this verse the most clearly, they never put their heart into their prayers. So examine yourself. I need to examine myself. Do I put my heart into my prayer? He continues, what about us? Do you and I pray with our entire being, or do we just rattle off a memorized prayer like some pagan chant or perhaps sleepily mumble a few half-hearted requests to God just before drifting off to sleep. I'm sure we all have done that one time or another. But it's the effective, fervent prayer that makes a big difference. And you can listen to Dr. Meredith's sermon, number 614, Seven Keys to Answered Prayer. Along that line, I might encourage you to look at our new four-in-one. We finally have completed all 24 lessons of the Bible study course in a four-in-one format. This has just been printed, lesson 21 through lesson 24, a Tomorrow's World Understanding Original Christianity. Lesson 22, of course, this is written by Mr. John O'Gwynn, is Understanding the Power of Prayer. I'll just read the headings on this. Understanding Christ's Instructions, Praying in Jesus' Name, Examples of Answered Prayer, different kinds of prayers, keys to answered prayer. Can prayer really change your life? So those are some of the headings from Lesson 22 of the Bible Study Course, and of course many of you have already completed that, and for those of you who have not, I encourage you to continue your studies in tomorrow's World Bible Study Course. How many people in the United States pray regularly? According to Barna Research Group, April 3rd, 2006, slightly more than four out of five adults claim that they have prayed the last week or sometime in the last week, about 84%. And 
And that has been the case since Bonner has been doing this research in the frequency of prayer since 1993. So it's mainly uh, 83%. How many Americans say they pray every day? A Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life, February 26, 2009, states that 66% of American women say they pray at least daily, compared to 49% of men. So again, our society, 89% of the women uh, pray, uh, they say they pray every day, or 66% every day, and 49% of the men every day. But of course, we have to ask the question, that's good, and we're thankful that there's a certain degree of sincerity. But again, we have to answer the question, as Jesus said, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say, Luke 6 and verse 46. So what makes us righteous when James says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much? Remember, we're warned that there is the self-righteousness, which God calls filthy rags. And so many of us, some of us, from time to time, have experienced self-righteousness. But where does our righteousness come from? Of course, it's from Christ in us that, we, that makes us righteous. And we heard in the sermonette, Matthew 6, that we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And when I pray that, I think of Christ as being my righteousness, because he's my great high priest, our great high priest, at the right hand of God. We need to pray for one another. Why should we pray for one another? I want to give you a few reasons for that. We already saw in James 5 that we pray for one another. Why? That you may be healed. And I know that I've been healed in the past, and I know that when I had my extreme back pain some years ago that I received cards and uh, emails from all over the world. And I know that people were praying for me, and it really made a difference in my life. And even some of our local individuals who are sick and, and ill, as you just heard in the sermonette, uh, excuse me, in the announcements, uh, that uh, our brethren do receive encouragement from all over the world when they are ill. And of course, we follow in our church bulletin, we see those who are ill and sick and need to be healed. But God has intervened dramatically. One of the most dramatic healings or interventions was written up in the Worldwide News back, I'm not sure I have the date correctly, but I think it was in the 70s. And it was, took place in Newport News, Virginia. And here's a photo in the Worldwide News of this man. And the subhead is pinned under truck bed and load of gravel. A church member had requested gravel brought to her home. And when he backed, I'll just read from her letter here, he backed up the truck into the driveway and raised the bed of the truck, then got out to find the gravel had not come out. He had forgotten to release the lever on the tailgate. The bed of the truck was now in a raised position so that the young man jumped upon the bed to grab the lever, which he could not reach from the ground. The man weighing about 160 pounds caught hold of the bed with one hand and reached for the lever with the other. The bed fell on him. So you can imagine, here is this, this bed of the truck in an inclined position. He crawls under it and the bed snaps or you know, snaps right down on him. And he's crushed with the bed of the truck on the steel frame and between the cab of the truck. She says, I yelled for him to jump. He tried, but his foot was caught in the frame of the truck. He was in a sitting position with his leg in a bent position, with his back against the cab of the truck, the bed of the truck, plus the load of the gravel came crushing down on his knee. He yelled for me to pull the gears. I jumped in the truck, and as soon as I did, the motor cut off. My daughter and I tried hard to start the motor three times, but we failed. We tried to get the bed to go up, but again, we failed. The man was now being crushed in his stomach and chest. I ran to get help. In the meantime, my daughter Debbie, 13-year-old, so you 13-year-olds listen, had been inside the house twice to pray. She stood by him all the time. I couldn't stand to watch. It was so horrible. 
We screamed for help again and again. A lot of women came, but no man. They were all still at work. I looked again and saw the bed of the truck was all the way down in its normal position. I began to pray and ask God to spare his life. Debbie, the 13-year-old, was beside him, and his last words to her were to pray. She ran into the house again to pray for him. All that could be seen of him now was a small portion of his face and some of his shoulder. He was black and blue. He stayed this way for about eight to ten minutes. When Debbie and I went back out, the bed of the truck was raised. A man down the street had heard the scream and came to help. A nurse came and lifted him up and said he was light as a baby. The nurse put him on the ground and tried to give him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. She said it was hopeless because of the fluid in his mouth. She said the fluid indicated severe lung puncture. As we looked on, his shape and color came back just as if he were waking up from sleep. He smiled so sweetly and looked at us and said, I'm all right. Now he was crushed, and here's a photo of the two inches between the bed of the truck and the cab of the truck in which he was squashed, squashed into two inches. And yet he came back fully, was taken to the hospital, and uh, one and a half hours later, he was released from the hospital, did not have a broken bone, no brain damage, no punctures, only a small scratch on his arm, which didn't even require a Band-Aid. All the people looking on said this was a complete miracle. My daughter Debbie, who was 13 years old, didn't wait for a man's help. She trusted God from the very beginning. She said later, Mama, if I had run away, he would have lost faith. This is just one of incredible miracles that we hear from time to time. But as we heard in the sermonette, that God can do anything. He can perform miracles that are way beyond our imagination. We sometimes limit God in what he can do. So God does heal, and our prayers do make, an, make a difference. Let's turn to one of the examples, Luke 6 and verse 17, <clears throat> to show just the matter of Christ's attitude towards healing. And of course, Dr. Meredith covered this in a sermon a couple weeks ago. But again, it's so encouraging to realize God's attitude towards those who need his intervention. Luke, the sixth chapter, Luke 6, I'll get the right verse, and starting with verse 17, Luke 6 and verse 17. Jesus heals a great multitude, is the subhead. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a crowd of his disciples, and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and he healed and to be healed of their diseases as well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits and they were healed. Verse 19, and the whole multitude sought to touch him for power went out from him and he healed them all. Again, we need that kind of faith that we've been hearing about in recent sermons. And I want to encourage you to have a prayer list. Maybe some of you do. You know you pray for your family, your husband, your wife, your father, your mother, your son or daughter, uh, perhaps every day, and you don't have a formal list as such. This is my little week at a glance that I carry around with me. And I have printed out in tiny type so that I was able to uh, paste it in here I, on this page, I have up to number 50, and over on this page, up to number 62, in small type. And I have here 60, I keep adding names to it, I have about 62 names here listed. You know, three years ago this summer, I was there in the kitchen in our office, and uh, one of our church members, one of our employees was uh, in tears, and I said, well, what's the matter? She says, well... My friend back in Louisiana has just called and she's dying of cancer and she was just really concerned of her life. She had some other health issues as well. And I said, you know what, on my list, she is number one on my list and I'm praying for her. And to this day, that was three years later, she's still alive, she's not died of cancer. And I hope that you have a list of people to pray for 
And of course, uh, there are people, as I say, you don't even have to remember, but uh, the one you have a list of about 62 people, uh, it, it's very helpful uh, to be praying for them. Years ago, I wrote for the Ambassador Portfolio. This was October 24th, 1980. Who's on your list? Let me just read from my uh, editorial here <clears throat> from the Ambassador Portfolio. There are many kinds of lists. There are shopping lists, to-do lists, multitudinous checklists, and enemy hit lists. There are the popular The Book of Lists and The Book of Lists too, as well as the more recent Meredith's Book of Bible Lists. This morning, while looking into a seldom used desk drawer in my home study, I found a couple of old lists of a different nature, prayer lists. Uh, one was on the back of an old IBM card. Those of you know ancient uh, IBM uh, computers, that was done with, with uh, cards. And you punch, hole punch the cards and put the cards through the computer, and that was how the computation took place and how processing took place. Well, I used one of those old cards, and I had on it a heading of work, student faculty, feast organization, as well as second tithe, building fund, emergency fund. Another heading on the old prayer list was government, with the then President Gerald Ford noted at the top, followed by Mr. Richard Nixon. Mr. Herbert Armstrong, in a plain truth personal, had exhorted readers to pray for them both. Next on the list was Governor Dolph Briscoe and Lieutenant Governor Reagan Brown of Texas, where I lived at the time. Also under the government heading was the nation that Mr. Armstrong had referred to as the most impoverished nation I had ever seen, Bangladesh. Well, I won't continue with all of this, but as I went down the article, I said, uh, I'll just read this particular part, and I'll quote the scripture later on, one of my favorite scriptures of Hebrews 7.25, which says, He, Christ, is able to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him, seeing that he ever lives to make intercession for them. Christ is our great high priest. He's always at the right hand of God to intercede for you and me because he knows your pain. He knows your problems. He knows what it's like to be betrayed. He knows what it's like to be persecuted. And so he's there to intercede for us. I finished the article by saying, you are on Christ's prayer list now. And remember, Jesus prayed for you when you were an enemy of God. Do you have any enemies on your prayer list as opposed to hit list? We can all rejoice that God is willing to remember our names and to write them down. Jesus Christ has us on his prayer list who's on your list. So again, brethren, I hope that we are praying for one another and that we just don't have a small number of people to pray for, because I know that it can go on and on and on, and we can have hundreds of people to pray for, but we do have to focus on those and respond to those requests for healing. So why should we pray for others? So that others can be healed. Another reason, of course, is to change circumstances, negative circumstances, to positive blessings. We pray for miracles. Reading back here again in James, where we found the theme of praying for one another. James, the fifth chapter, and starting with verse 17. James gives an example of Elijah. And Elijah, of course, uh, prayed, and it stopped for raining for th three and a half years. But he mentions this about Elijah, James 5, verse 17. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. No, he had human nature. He ran from Jezebel. He had his weaknesses. He was a man like we are, and yet he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. Verse 18, and he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. And I saw some of you have mentioned that you have prayed for rain from time to time, and uh, God has intervened. I think of Ephesians 3.20, as you've heard me say, is one of my favorite promises of God, that he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. God is unlimited. And I've claimed that promise several times, and 
I don't want to bore you with uh, uh, telling my stories all over again, but God has ex had answered that prayer. He has done exceedingly abundantly above all that I ever could think or ask. So why do we pray for our brethren? We pray for miracles. We pray that circumstances can change from negative to positive. Let's take a look here in Acts, the 12th chapter. Remember that the apostle Peter was imprisoned, and the brethren prayed for him. Acts 12, and we'll start in verse 5. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers. No way he could get out. And the guards before the door were keeping the prison. So he has chains on him, has two guards on either side of them, and guards at the door. No way he can get out. Now behold, an angel of the Lord, verse 7, stood by him, and a light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to them, Put on your garment and follow me. And so he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but he thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of, opened to them of its own accord, and they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, verse 11, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. The people, as it said, gave constant prayer for him, verse 5. Constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Our prayers do make a difference. So pray for miracles. I don't have the time to go back to that, but you know the story of Queen Esther and how Mordecai told her that she needed to intervene or all the Jewish race were going to be exterminated. And, of course, she told Mordecai, go Gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. She was willing to lay down her life. But again, the community was fasting and praying, and God intervened. So a second reason for praying for one another is to change negative circumstances to positive blessings and to pray for miracles. The third one is brought out here in James, the fifth chapter. We keep going back to James 5. I should have told you to hold your place there. James 5. And that is pray to save a brother or sister from falling away. James 5, verse 19. James 5 here in 1 Peter. Bring back the erring one is the subhead. James 5, 19. Brethren, if any among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. And of course, as ministers, we run into this kind of situation all the time. Well, not all the time, but regularly. I know one individual who was knowingly working on the Sabbath, and he knew it was wrong. And I told him, Joe, his name was not Joe, look, you're headed for the lake of fire. You need to do what God tells you to do. And he's still with us to this day. So in love, we try to help our brethren so they can stay on the right track. And as uh, Barclay, William Barclay, in his commentary calls this, these two verses, the supreme human achievement. He writes in his commentary on the letters of James and Peter, page 133, James finishes his letter with one of the greatest and most uplifting thoughts in the New Testament, and yet one which occurs more than once in the Bible. Suppose a man goes wrong and strays away, and suppose a fellow Christian rescues him from the error of his ways and brings him back to the right path. That man has not only saved his brother's soul, he has covered a multitude of sins. So, and then uh, let's 
turn to, well, I won't, I'll just quote that scripture, 1 Timothy 4. But here we need to pray for our brethren who may be weak. And as you know, we've had uh, lost sheep. And we fasted as a church and a congregation for those who were the lost sheep. And many have come back. I told you before about being in Daytona at the feast several years ago and meeting a church member who had grown up in the church and attended the festivals and been gone 30 years and said, this is my first feast back after 30 years. We pray for those who've gone astray. In Paducah, Kentucky, I met a person who had been gone for 40 years and had just come back to the church. And then just a few months ago, when we were up in Nashville for the NRVB convention, when I had mentioned that actually in a sermon, one lady came up to me after service and said, I, I was uh, gone from the church for 35 years and I've been coming back now for about six months. So never give up in praying for those who have gone astray, those who may be the lost sheep, those who may be in your family that have grown up in the church and have left the church. You pray for them. You never give up on them. You have that unconditional love. Someday, God will work with them. The light will turn on in their heads, and they'll come back from being lost sheep into the fold, as several of these have already done. Always pray for the lost sheep. Let's turn to Luke, the 22nd chapter, Luke 22. And here Jesus prayed for Simon, or the one who was called Peter, Luke 22 and verse 31. Luke 22, verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. So Jesus knew the attacks on the church and on his servants, his disciples, but I have prayed for you, Jesus says in verse 32, that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. And of course, he betrayed Jesus three times, denied him three times that night. But he did return. And he did strengthen the brethren. But Jesus prayed for him that his faith not fail. We continue to pray for our brothers and sisters Pray for the spiritually weak brethren. Pray to save a, a sister or a brother who is falling away. Pray for the lost sheep, and they will come back. Another reason to pray for one another is to express love, care, concern, and passion for others. It's just another way of loving one another. Colossians, the fourth chapter. Colossians 1. I certainly appreciate the sermonette and had no idea that Mr. Colon was going to be speaking on a timely subject. Colossians 4 and verse 2. Here the Apostle Paul tells the Colossians, Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Again, one of the keys of prayer is to pray with thanksgiving, to have an attitude of gratitude when you pray. If you don't know what to pray about, just start thanking God for all your blessings. Meanwhile, praying also for us. Who should you pray for? The Apostle Paul is saying, look, pray for us, the ministry, that God would open to us a door for the word to speak. The mystery of Christ for which I am also in chains. He was in prison when he wrote this. That I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. So we need to pray for one another to express love, care, concern, compassion, but also that the gospel will go out in greater power. We had a sermon number 307, Into All the World, where we had a world map, and it might help you to have a world map to think of all of our brethren, where they are around the world. Of course, we have one at our headquarters building showing all of the feast sites around the world. I think the church administration has a map showing all of the congregations uh, around the world, and it gives you a perspective of the salt of the earth and the light of the world and where God's people are scattered. And to think of our ministers in South Africa and the Philippines and Malaysia 
and in Europe and uh, Canada and Mexico and around the world that we not just limit ourselves, we have that big picture and we're praying for our brethren around the world. Colossians, the fourth chapter and verse 12, speaking of one man that the Apostle Paul commended, Epiphus, verse 12, Epiphus, who is a, one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you, listen to this, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. So here was someone who was dedicated to praying fervently, laboring fervently for you in prayers. The Apostle Paul prayed for his congregations and for those to whom he wrote epistles. Look at Romans 1, the first chapter. Romans, the first chapter, verse 8. So he's writing to all the saints that are at Rome called to be saints, as it says in verse 7. Verse 8, First I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. And I know Dr. Meredith speaks about his praying for our brethren around the world, for the co-workers and for the ministry. We need to pray for one another, for the ministry, for our brethren, all around the world. The Apostle Paul said that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by some means now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. And of course, in chapter 16 of Romans, the Apostle Paul mentions about 35 names and so again, I don't know if he had a long list, uh, but he knew in his own mind that he could mention 35 names in his epistle. It's amazing. And so we need to pray for our brethren, our ministers around the world, pray for, of course, our local congregation here. And we have a congregational photo album coming up in a few weeks, and that will help you pray for one another as well. So we've seen four different ways of praying for one another, reasons so that we can be healed. We pray for miracles to change negative circumstances to positive blessings. We pray for lost sheep and the spiritually weak so that they can come back in the, the fold and be strengthened. And we pray for one another who express love, care, concern, and compassion. But should we pray for just one another or for others who are not in the church of God? I think you know the answer to that. That's 1 Timothy, the second chapter. So let's turn back to 1 Timothy, the second chapter. And again, how responsive are we to the instructions of God's word? Do we actually implement, respond to, obey the instructions? 1 Timothy 2 and verse 1. Therefore, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable, peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, verse 4, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So do you pray for others? Years ago, I heard about a, uh, an accident that had taken place in the Atlantic Ocean. It was a uh, manned submarine that was used to lay cable across the Atlantic. And, of course, this 20-foot mini-sub called Pieces III had, was piloted by Roger Chapman, uh, 28 years of age. And, it, and the cable broke, and it descended down to the bottom of the Atlantic, and this was 150 miles southwest of Cork, Ireland. Its mission was to bury part of a transatlantic cable. And uh, Roger Malone was the uh, other uh, pilot in the submarine. And uh, they couldn't, they worked for hours. They were just helpless. They were detached from the mother ship. It seemed like there was nothing that could happen. I heard about it on the radio and I know I started praying for those individuals. I didn't know them. I just knew that they were at the bottom of the ocean. 
And I'm sure hundreds, if not thousands of others, were praying for these two men as well. Well, the mother company sent over another mini-sub that actually flew it over to Ireland, took it out to this location, and they finally were able, after hours and hours locating the mini-sub, and then finally attaching a cable to it to start to bring it up to the top. And, of course, they were freezing, they were cold, the temperature was 50 degrees, the humidity was 98 degrees, they were chattering, teeth were chattering, and they finally got up to the, the surface of the water, and one of the cables broke, but thankfully they had attached two cables and finally rescued them. And they had only like uh, an hour of oxygen left or 50 minutes left before they were rescued. But I felt through that whole experience that my prayer of intercession made a difference. You say, well, maybe it didn't. Maybe it was the prayers of other people. Well, I believe my prayer made a difference in praying for someone halfway around the world. And I'm sure that many of us, when we heard about the Chile disaster of the miners trapped 2,200 feet below the surface, we prayed for them, and they were eventually all rescued. So we pray for people around the world because we have a love, and we understand that God says to pray for all men, and we pray for those who are in trouble. Yes, we pray for people in the world. We pray for those who are in authority, as the Apostle Paul says here in verse 2, for kings and all who are in authority. So do we pray for our government leaders? We may not agree with our government leaders, but do we pray for President Barack Obama and Vice President Joe Biden and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton? And perhaps you don't know the others in the cabinet, but Treasury the Secretary is Timothy Geithner, Defense Secretary Leon Panetta, and uh, others. Those are the sequence if someone were to die in the order of succession of the presidency. And we should be praying for the governors of our state, and perhaps uh, most of you know. Let me just give you a test. I don't mean to embarrass you, but how many of you know the name of the governor of North Carolina? Let me see your hands. Okay, I can't see as many hands as I usually do, so it looks like it's about 50%, so very good. But it's Beverly Perdue is the governor of North Carolina. And again, we may not agree with their administration. And who is, how many of you know the name of the mayor of Charlotte, North Carolina? See your hands. Okay, only about 33%. So that is uh, Mr. Fox. I better get its first name, Anthony Fox, uh, who was elected November 2009, Mr. Anthony Fox. So here we are in Charlotte. We should be praying for Mayor Anthony Fox. And I'll just mention South Carolina. Some of you from South Carolina, do you know who that governor is? Nikki Haley, Georgia's Nathaniel Deal, California. Uh, why California? Well, uh, they're in trouble. And uh, Jerry Brown has come back after 30 years of being a governor in the first place. Jerry Brown, Missouri, uh, Jay Nixon, Texas, Rick Perry, New York, Andrew Cuomo. Now, Dr. Meredith used to give tests in his classes about world leaders. Who is the world leader or, or the prime minister of Canada? That is Stephen Harper, the prime minister of Britain, David Cameron. And who is the Prime Minister of Australia? Julia uh, Gillard. And then New Zealand, where Dr. Uh, Douglas Winnale is right now, Prime Minister John Key. India is Prime Minister Singh, S-I-N-G-H. And of course, Russia, Vladimir Putin. And then there are other world leaders as well. Who is the President of China? Hu Jintao. And of course, now we have broadcast into China from Hong Kong, and we need to again focus a little more, become a little more educated on China. In fact, just Wednesday was a full page ad uh, by uh, featuring uh, one of our former uh, executives uh, who is very well known in China, uh, featuring an advertising China Daily newspaper. 
But we, uh, if you want to check on our website for Hong Kong, it's tomorrowsworldhk.com. I think you'll uh, find that interesting. So be praying for China. In fact, uh, of course, we have one of our members here who does business and has traveled to China uh, right in our audience. You can talk to him afterwards. I won't mention his name. In France, President Nicolas Sarkozy, or Sarkozy, and then uh, Germany, the Chancellor Angela Merkel, Ireland, President Mary McAleese, and Mexico, President Felipe Calderon, in the Philippines, President Benigno Aquino III, South Africa, President Jacob Zuma. So again, not that you need to know all these names, but again, in principle, God says that we are to make intercessions, supplications, prayers, and giving of thanks for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. I referred to the scripture before, but let's turn back to Hebrews, the seventh chapter, to know that you have an advocate. I shouldn't confess to you my, my sins, but I did get stopped for speeding one time. And uh, as a result, I must have gotten about 20 letters from lawyers saying, you know, here, I'll be your advocate and so forth. And uh, I did avail myself of that advocacy and uh, cut my, my fine down in half. So lawyers can make a difference. And of course, Christ is our advocate. As it tells us in 1 John 2, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He pleads our case. He's our advocate, our lawyer, our intercessor. Hebrews, the seventh chapter, and verse 23. Hebrews 7, verse 23. Anybody got the right? Okay. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. The context here, of course, is the priesthood. Verse 24. But he, referring to Christ, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Now, God has called us to be kings, priests, and judges. Christ is the high priest. But priests have a responsibility of teaching the law, teaching God's way, and also for interceding and pleading the case of others. And we'll be doing that throughout the millennium as God's kings, priests, and judges. Therefore, he, verse 25, Christ is also able to save to the uttermost, or completely or forever, those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. We don't have a physical high priest. We have a spiritual high priest who lives forever. He's always at the right hand of God to intercede for you. He sympathizes with you. He knows your pain. He knows your trials. He knows your suffering. And he's always there. Of course, that's brought out in Hebrews, the fourth chapter. We might as well just review that briefly. Turn back a page here to Hebrews 4.14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. When you're going through pain, you're thinking no one else in the world knows what kind of pain I'm going through. Well, Christ does. And other human beings who've experienced pain, extreme pain, perhaps not by the same health uh, illness or health condition. But we can sympathize with one another. We can have compassion on one another. But Christ was tempted in all points as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So we need to pray for those who are world leaders, those who are governors, those who are mayors. And we can be thankful for those leaders who have in their leadership of nations or of communities have led their communities in prayer to God. Of course, Abraham Lincoln was one of the prime examples that most of you know about as you read the history of the United States and Great Britain in prophecy. And you know that it was April 30th, 1863,
President, Abraham's Lincoln, Ab President Abraham Lincoln's proclamation, a day of national humiliation, fasting, and prayer in the United States of America on April 30th, 1863. And this is remarkable. You think, can this happen today in 2011? Whereas the Senate of the United States, devoutly recognizing, devoutly recognizing the supreme authority and just government of Almighty God in all the affairs of men and nations, has by a resolution required the president to designate and set apart a day for national prayer and humiliation. And president Lincoln wrote, Whereas it is the duty of nations as well as of men to owe their dependence upon the overruling power of God, and as we come to the day of independence, we, of course, as God's people, proclaim our dependence on God. And so Abraham Lincoln said or wrote, it is the duty of nations as well as of men to owe their dependence upon the overruling power of God, to confess their sins and transgressions in humble sorrow, yet with assured hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon, and to recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proving by, proven by all history that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. A remarkable proclamation. He goes on to say, We have been the recipients of the choicest blessings of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power, as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom of our own. The little creature here is, uh, you fly away there, thank you. <laughs> Amazing, God says spiders end up in palaces, so. You know. But we have forgotten God, and can we say this is so, Timely. This, could, this proclamation could be uh, written today. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of, a heart, of our heart that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace. Too proud to pray to the God that made us. It behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power, to confess our national sins, and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. And of course, you know that the nation was preserved in the war between the states, the Civil War. And we as a nation today need to humble ourselves Will we find that kind of leadership if we don't nationally? A God's people stand in the gap, as it says in Ezekiel. He looked for a man that stood in the gap and he found none. But we are the people to stand in the gap and to pray for our country and to pray for the Western world and for people to repent and change and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And of course, you know the story of Jonah where he went to Nineveh and said, 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. And how did the nation respond? The king proclaimed a fast, and even the animals would fast. And God preserved the nation. One of the only examples that we know of that preserved in history where a nation changed after the preaching of, its pro of a prophet. One other leader also led the nation in prayer. That was King George VI when he called the nation to prayer in May 26, 1940. You know the story. We've written about it in our, our booklets. About 335,000 Allied troops that were trapped in Dunkirk. And there was no way that they could be released. They were trapped and there was no escape. This is a booklet. We have a guardian that uh, gives some of the history, history of that time. And Winston Churchill, in a speech to the House of Commons on June 4th, said, 
When a week ago today I asked the House to fix this afternoon as the occasion for a statement, I feared it would be my hard lot to announce the greatest military disaster in our long history. I thought, and some good judges agreed with me, that perhaps 20,000 or 30,000 men might be reembarked. The whole root and core and brain of the British Army on which and around which we were to build and are to build the great British armies in the later years of the war seemed about to perish upon the field or to be led into ignominious and starving captivity. That was the problem. Of 335,000, Winston Churchill thought that only 20 or 30,000 would be saved. And yet King George VI called a national day of prayer. And he called the people of Britain and the empire to commit their cause to God. And together with the members of the cabinet, um, while millions of subjects all over the commonwealth and empire flocked to churches to join in prayer. And of course it was called the miracle of the calm seas. It's called the miracle of Dunkirk. Sunday, June 9th was appointed as a day of national thanksgiving. And again, there were two miracles that took place, a violent storm in the calm seas. And Winston Churchill called it a miracle of deliverance. When leaders take the lead and God and people, in this case, the people of Great Britain and the Commonwealth prayed, 335,000 were delivered. You know the story, and we've had it on our telecast to see some of the film footage of little ships, little boats, everything that was available that went across the English Channel to Dunkirk on the western coast of Europe and evacuated 335,000 troops. We need leaders to pray, and some have had the courage to do so, even governors of states. As you know, some years ago, 2007, there was a drastic drought in Georgia, and the governor at the time, Sonny Perdue, led a prayer for rain on Tuesday, November 13, 2007. Associated Press reported, quote, Georgia and its neighboring states are caught in an epic drought that threatens public water supplies. Georgia Governor Sonny Perdue, Sonny Perdue stepped up to a podium outside the state capitol on Tuesday and led a solemn crowd of several hundred people in a prayer for rain on his drought-stricken state. We commend those who will lead their people and acknowledge God. Governor Rick Perry of Texas did the same this year in a proclamation for days of prayer for rain in Texas. The proclamation was issued April 21st this year, 2011. Whereas the state of Texas is in the midst of exceptional drought, with some parts of the state receiving no significant rainfall for almost three months, matching rainfall deficit records dating back to the 1930s. And he goes on telling about the drought and the problems throughout history. Therefore, I, Rick Perry, governor of Texas, under the authority vested me by the Constitution, and statutes of the state of Texas do hereby proclaim the three-day period from Friday, April 22nd to Sunday, April 24th as days of prayer for rain in the state of Texas. It's amazing, and yet we commend those who have that kind of leadership. So we not only pray, brethren, for one another, we pray for leaders, for kings, for queens, for prime ministers, for governors, for mayors, as we're instructed in 1 Timothy, the second chapter. You can and you should pray for government leaders, but can you love government leaders? Can you love unconverted relatives? Can you practice unconditional love? One individual was surfing the internet and came upon my sermon on our LCG website. The sermon was titled Unconditional Love. He wrote me a lengthy letter and he said he had serious concerns with my sermon because he asserted that God's love is not unconditional. And why did he believe that? Well, he began to cite all of the examples in the Bible of cause and effect. And we know, as I wrote him back, I said, well, certainly. 
uh, you have cited correctly many examples of conditional love and conditional blessings. And one of the main themes from the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is blessings come from obedience to God and curses will come from disobedience to God. And so, yes, it's conditional from time right from the beginning to the end. And Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8 tell us, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For if he sows to the flesh, he will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. It is a law of cause and effect. Yes, God expresses his love through, uh, to us through many conditional blessings. His way of life consistently teaches that we are to obey his commandments in the physical as well as their spiritual magnification in order to reap the blessings. But he also expects humans to practice in an appropriate way a type of unconditional love. So are there biblical examples of unconditional love? I want to show you one of perhaps the most key tests of true Christianity. There are many, but this one is a deep spiritual one. Let's turn to Matthew, the fifth chapter, Matthew 5. Matthew 5. We're to pray for one another. We're to pray for all men, as the apostle Paul wrote to us. Matthew 5, starting with uh, verse 46. Here Jesus talks about the, or contrast, the normal human social interaction with a Christian's love. Chapter 5, verse 46. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even tax collectors do so? It's natural to love those who love us, but Christ demanded something deeper. Starting in verse 43. You have heard that it was said, or has been said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. What? Have any of you done that? Is it a part of your Christian character to love your enemies? Who are your enemies? Well, he defines it here as some of those characteristics. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those that hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. So here's a kind of love and prayer. He says, pray for them. I know one time, some years ago, in the house we lived there in Rancho Bernardo, north of San Diego, we had a balcony area, and I was just walking by, and I heard my wife praying for some of the enemies of the church who had actually caused disruption in the church, and she was praying for them by name. And it really impressed me. I thought, well, do I do that? And do, who are, I, I don't try to conjure up who are my past enemies that often, but every once in a while I do, and I realize, you know, maybe they can yet be converted. Remember the Apostle Paul was an enemy of the church, and Christ appeared to him and said, why are you persecuting me? And later on, the apostle Paul wrote and said he was chief of sinners, that he persecuted the church of God, and he stood by while Stephen was martyred. Oh, well, here was a chief of sinners, and yet the worst of sinners, if you want to categorize it that way, as Paul did, was converted. He was later converted. Well, loving our enemies is not natural. And as the Anchor Bible Dictionary, Volume 4, under the subject of love, parentheses, New Testament and early Jewish, parentheses, closed, because there are all kinds of love abroad, the subject, of course, the Anchor Bible Dictionary, under the subhead, the agape family, talking about 
that particular Greek word throughout the New Testament. The mandate for Christians to love their enemies stretches human capacity to its limits. <laughs> yes, it does in a natural way. But is based on God's love for humans. While we were his enemies, Romans 5.10. Paul says that of the three things that last forever, faith, hope, and love, the greatest of them all is love. Let's turn to Luke, the sixth chapter. Luke 6 is the parallel account of this instruction by Christ. Luke 6, starting in verse 27. And here we get different uh, perspectives. But I say to you who hear, Luke 6, verse 27, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you. And from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. And just as you want men to do to you, do also to them likewise. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. Is that your nature? And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do that, do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. Verse 35, Luke 6. But love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be the sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful, and evil. Therefore, be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. The Anchor Bible Dictionary, page 388, comments, What is most important for Luke is that the disciple can become a child of God. The attribute of God which is most important is compassion toward the ungrateful and the wicked. Lacking is any utilitarian motive. This ethical guidance is fully and exclusively rooted in the nature and behavior of God. The only reward which is in sight is a relationship with God. Again, you may want to review Dr. Meredith's sermon, The First Great Commandment, which he gave a few weeks ago, sermon number 649. So loving our enemies is not natural. But does he tell us to love our enemies if they repent, is there some condition that we have in order to love our enemies, or is that love unconditional? Perhaps if our enemies apologize, then we should love them? No. Christ's plain instruction is to love our enemies even though they persecute us. He tells us to love our enemies without preset conditions. And if we set a condition on loving our enemies, we are telling Christ that he's wrong. So let's understand, brethren, that God expects us to hate evil. Proverbs 8.13, the fear of the eternal is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy in the froward mouth do I hate. We're to love good and abhor evil. We abhor the sin, but we love the sinner. And in this violent world, we need to take steps for security and safety for our family. Proverbs 22.3, the prudent sees the evil and hides himself, but the foolish pass on and are punished. We need to pray for God's protection, as it brings out in Psalm 91, that psalm of protection. I pray for protection every day, and I hope you do too. Not just for me, but for uh, the church and, and others. God is going to judge the wicked in the end of time, in his time. He says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. That's in Hebrews 10, verse 30. But in this dangerous end time, can we also love our enemies? Can we practice both loving authority and unconditional love? I hope all of you have read uh, Dr. Jeffrey Fall's uh, booklet, successful parenting God's way. He emphasizes loving authority in rearing children. But he also uses the term unconditional love in his booklet ten times. 
As I may have told you before, I know when I was growing up as a boy, I knew I was doing wrong things, but I also knew that my parents loved me. Yes, they had conditional love, loving authority, but I knew they also had unconditional love. That if I ever repented and went back, I know they would forgive me and accept me. And I know that most, and I hope that most of you, because we are Christian families, that we do practice both loving authority and unconditional love in our families. John 3.16 is called the golden verse or the most precious verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What condition did God put on giving his Son? He didn't put any conditions on sacrificing his Son for the world. He loved the world. And he did not say that he loved the world because the world loved him first. Turn back here to 1 John, the fourth chapter, 1 John 4. 1 John 4, very encouraging verse, but at the same time shows us the reality of God's unconditional love. As we just read and or just cited in John 3.16. 1 John 4 and verse 19. We love him because he first loved us. When did God love us? After we repented? No, he loved us before we loved him. Turn back to Romans 5, Romans the fifth chapter. I just, it was referred to here in that anchor Bible dictionary commentary. I just quoted Romans the fifth chapter. Did God love us when we repented, but not before? Romans 5, verse Six, Romans 5, verse 6. For when we were still sinners without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. And there are many heroes that we see in television or in newspapers that have sacrificed their lives trying to save a child or trying to save another person. But God, verse 8, demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So God loved us even when we were his enemies, as it goes on to say. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Verse 10, for if when we were his enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So God gives us unconditional love, but we have to respond to that unconditional love. Sadly, there are many who will not respond to that unconditional love. And the Apostle Paul writes about that in Romans 2 and verse 4. And he's writing to those in Rome. There were both Jews and Gentiles in the congregation there in Rome. And uh, he's trying to make sure that they all understand that Jews and Gentiles are all sinners, for all have sinned. And he says that in uh, Romans 3, verse 23. But here, Romans 2, verse 4. Do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? But in accordance with the hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath, in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds, eternal life to those who by patience continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, but those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. So. Again, God does not play uh, partiality. He says it's the same for Jews and Greeks. But we need to respond to God's love. We love him because he first loved us. So will we obey Christ? Will we follow his instructions? How can we love our enemies? Well, right back in Romans 5, verse 5, again, one of the most 
powerful verses we probably emphasized on the day of Pentecost, how we can be Christian, how we can do those things that are not according to, which seem to be impossible from a worldly point of view to love your enemies. Romans 5, verse 5, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which, as it should read, has been given to us. So you have power. That power is God's Holy Spirit. Power to change, power to overcome, power to become a more converted and deeply loving child of God. So God's Spirit gives us the power to love our enemies. It gives us the power to bless those who curse us. It gives us the power to do good to those who hate us. God's Spirit gives us the power to pray for those who spitefully use us and persecute us. So brethren, if we obey Christ, then, as he said in Matthew 5, 45, we may be sons of our Father in heaven, for he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So God has given us loving conditions that when we fulfill those conditions, they produce wonderful and awesome blessings. He's given us the two great commandments mentioned in Matthew 22, verses 37 and 40. And he says, if we are to enter into life, we must keep the commandments, Matthew 19, verse 17. So the scriptures reveal the conditions and the requirements for living an abundant life. But as Christians, we also rejoice in God's unconditional love for us, which makes it possible for us to respond in love to him. God has called us to be a loving family through Christ in us. And one of the ways of practicing that love is to pray for one another. We pray for one another so that we may be healed. We pray for miracles so that we can change negative circumstances to positive blessings. We pray for the lost sheep and to strengthen those who are weak. We pray for one another to express love, care, concern, and passion. God has called us to be kings and priests to give intercessory prayer. Christ intercedes for us. He's at God's right hand, and he instructs us to intercede for others. So if we're deeply converted, we will be praying for our enemies. And through God's spirit flowing out from us, we can practice unconditional love following Christ's example. He said in Matthew 5, 48, Therefore you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Perfect in agape love. We can all become more like Christ. It takes time for many of us to change. Some of us have more lessons to learn, and it's taking some of us, like myself, many years to learn some lessons. I thank God he's still correcting me and guiding me and helping me to grow. So as you pray for others, you pray that you can practice unconditional love as well as loving authority. You pray that God's love will flow out from you in rivers of living water. We as God's people extend God's love by preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. So brethren, pray for God's work. Pray for more open doors and the resources to go through those doors. And remember Romans 5, verse 5. Hope makes not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit that's given to us. So brethren, pray for miracles in God's church. Pray for one another. Pray for your enemies, that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven.